Hello and welcome. This is going to be a Project Healing Waters Charlottesville kind of presentation, instructional video on how to fish for trout in some of Virginia's spring creeks. Virginia is lucky that we have several spring creeks. We're going to talk about what that means here in just a minute. Uh, and it affords us opportunities to fish for trout uh, a little bit more uniquely than what you may think given traditional waters. All right, so what do we mean by a spring creek? Well, a spring creek means that the water is primarily fed by underground springs. And this brings with it something rather uh, unique to that water system, and that is a very stable water temperature. We're gonna find water temperatures that are gonna fluctuate throughout the entire year between maybe the upper 40s to the upper 50s. Might get a little colder, might get a little warmer, depending if we have extreme cold spurts or extreme warm snaps. But regardless, our, the water is going to stay within that kind of 10, 15, 20 degree range at most. This also means that it stays within the range that is very safe for trout to swim in and be able to feed in and be very active in. And that's important because that means that it is safe to fish for trout in spring creeks year round as long as the water levels are up high enough. Now they can go down in the summer or they can go way up during major rain events. So barring water conditions as far as the height, fishing is always safe. We don't have to worry about dissolved oxygen content like we have to with some of our other more traditional rivers um, and uh, especially our, our brook trout. Right, our brook trout, we're very limited in, in the time of year that we can fish for them because we want to make sure that water is at a low enough temperature. Okay, so something else that's really interesting about spring creeks is because that water temperature is really staying in about the 50s year round, it means that in the winter, this is some of the warmest water that you can fish in Virginia. And in the summer, this is some of the coolest water that you can fish in Virginia. And it also happens to be close to or around insect kind of generational activity. And so that means that they are very productive waters. So the trout can grow to be very large and healthy size, and we can have uh, great fishing using dry flies, using nymphs, um, using different types of uh, insects in the stage of the hatch, generally year round. Now we do want to make sure that we are mindful of what season we're in. So you can tell by the trees and everything behind me, this is in the middle of winter. Specifically, I'm filming at the end of January. Um, this means that certain types of uh, flies are probably not going to be suited. As an example, I'm not expecting a hopper hatch in the middle of January. So I'm probably not going to put on a lot of my terrestrial patterns. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't have a caddis hatch or we couldn't have a mayfly hatch in the middle of winter, depending upon the way our, our temperatures go. And so always keep a lookout. If you start seeing trout rise, then you may want to throw on a dry fly. Um, typically, they're feeding heavily on nymphs, so nymph fishing is great. Uh, right now, I actually have, we'll, we'll talk about my setup here in just a minute. I actually have a streamer on a little bit earlier in the day, so I'm going to be throwing more streamers. Later on, you know, I might be switching over to, to something like a dry fly or uh, a nymph as our air temperatures warm up, which can help for insect activity as well. All right, um, so we've talked a little bit about the water temperatures. We talked a little bit how they're gonna be more fertile. Uh, one of the things that we're gonna to notice too is that our waters are going to look a little bit different than a traditional uh, trout stream or river. Instead of our freestone streams that we're gonna find up in our mountains, by freestone we're talking about water that's cascading down bedrock, um, lots of just kind of open boulders and little pocket water, uh, we can find ourselves a lot more flat slack water. Right, so we can see here I've got a, a nice uh, small waterfall behind me and with some, some general rapids and then this all pans out into a nice kind of slow moving gentle current um, with a, a, a more of a classic uh, slope pattern for our, um, our river bottom <clears throat> or creek bottom. What that means is, is that on our edge we're going to be shallow, towards the middle we're going to dip down 
coming back up towards the other edge and there'll be a general channel that, that runs through and our trout are probably going to be hanging out somewhere around the edge of those, of those channels. In fact, I've seen a couple swimming around down here where that current is moving nice and slow. It's a nice conveyor belt for food. Um, the other thing that we're going to notice is that the bottoms of our spring creeks are going to be covered in a lot more moss and vegetation. In fact, one of the most famous spring creeks, not just in Virginia, but on the entire East Coast, is Mossy Creek, aptly named because there is lots of vegetation, lots of undergrowth in that very, very productive, very fertile spring creek. And so your trout are going to be laid up in there using that natural cover, coming out when they want to feed, and going back in. Uh, in this particular spring creek, we don't have as much vegetation, but you will see some kind of dark green patches. And if you pay attention, you'll notice that the trout tend to be hanging out around this. It gives them some natural cover and gives them a little bit of camouflage from um, birds kind of coming from above. And that's their primary predator that they're going to be worried about. Spring creeks are also going to be home with a little bit spookier trout. Right? These are, are trout that are feeding year round. They're getting a lot larger. Uh, there's a lot less die off that we're going to find. So we're going to find older trout. They're going to be a lot more leery of their surroundings. They're going to be feeding a lot more naturally. And what that means too is when we approach the waters, we want to make sure that we're doing so very calmly, very quietly. And uh, on the banks of these spring creeks, we want to be very careful because sometimes the banks, and we'll, we'll look at a couple examples. You can kind of see across where the bank is real steep coming straight down, um, but there are examples along this, this creek here where the bank is undercut. Now an undercut bank provides perfect cover for a trout. And that means that some of your bigger trout may be hanging out underneath that bank. This is especially true on Mossy Creek. On Mossy Creek, some of the biggest trout in that water you won't see. They will be under your feet if you're standing on that bank. That means any footsteps going over, they will hear. So a lot of times you will see people at, at some of the spring creeks really stoop down, watching their shadow over the water, um, and fishing considerably far away from the bank, fishing right along that edge. Especially in summer when we get our terrestrial hatches, we get our hoppers, um, maybe we might be fishing a mouse pattern, that's when some of those big, maybe brown trout, rainbow trout, depending upon what's in that, that creek, can be going out and can be feeding. All right, so let's talk about what rod we're going to be using in these types of, of waters. Uh, so what I have here is a five weight, pretty standard trout setup, right? So, um, you know, don't worry too much about your reel. Your reel in a, a spring creek is, is most trout fishing is going to be more or less a line holder. You may have to put a fish on a reel, so, but uh, for the most part, click and pause without a drag system are just fine. This particular reel has a drag system on it, um, but in general, what I'm more concerned about is having a very versatile rod for the types of flies I may be fishing in this waterway. So this is a five way. Means it's gonna be perfect for dry flies, it's gonna be perfect for fishing nymphs, and it's robust enough in its line weight to easily cast indicators and multi-nymph rigs. That can be important, right? If I need to be fishing an indicator, I wanna make sure that I'm not fishing something like a two or a three weight rod because I just won't have the ability to turn over that indicator, especially if I get into a larger pool like we have here. Now, most spring creeks, you're gonna find uh, a lot more narrow waterway. This just happens to be a wider pool. Um, so casting far isn't something you necessarily have to worry about. Now, the other thing is that spring creeks can hold some of the larger trout in Virginia. This means you may want to switch over to using something like a streamer. And of course I have on here a Crelex and I'll show you some of my streamers a little bit later. Um, this means, especially with this pattern with the dumbbell eyes, I need to be able to turn that streamer over. I need to be able to cast it more efficiently. And so again, that five weight is going to give me just enough weight to be able to effectively cast those streamers as well. So all in all, five weight is a great Virginia trout rod. Now you may find yourself saying, you know what, I'm gonna be fishing some bigger streamers, I'm gonna be fishing some bigger patterns, going after the larger fish. So you may wanna bump up to maybe a six 
or a seven weight, depending on how large you're fishing. Generally, a six is, is about as high as you need to go in, in Virginia for trout. Um, you also could downsize, could go down to a four weight, could go down to a three weight if you want. Again, you're gonna be a little bit limited in what you can do as far as the, the um, streamers that you're gonna be able to cast, as far as uh, multi-nymph rigs with indicators and, and the like. So just be careful about downsizing too far. Uh, the other thing to be mindful of, and especially pertinent today, is our spring creeks tend to be near more open fields, right? So in the history of Virginia, uh, when the settlers came and they, they laid down their farms and their plantations, being near a stream was of great value. It was going to be good water for, for livestock, good water for crops, a consistent source of water that should always be flowing even in the, the heat of summer. And so a lot of times you will find it near old agricultural fields or even still in agricultural fields. In fact, Mossy Creek is great because certain parts of it you will be fishing in a cow pasture. Um, that also means that there is less cover for wind. And here on the East Coast, we are famous for our winds. That means if I'm fishing a lighter weight rod and it's a windier day, I may really struggle with my casts. A five weight rod is gonna help me to cut through the wind. Obviously a six weight is gonna be that much better when it gets windy. Uh, the forecast today, they are calling for gusts up to 20 miles per hour, but I will be able to still fish. Cause again, I'm not trying to cast 80 feet. I'm not trying to cast, you know, even 60 feet. I'm aiming for that 10, to maybe 30, 40 foot range. You know, in, in a spring creek, that's more than enough distance that you need. A lot of times you're gonna be casting and, and, and uh, fishing a lot closer to you. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and take a couple of casts and really explain how we explore this water and, and how we're going to attack uh, kind of a more of a still pond like this. So here we see the head of our pool. Um, we see the heavy current coming right out of that waterfall, kind of hugging the bank on our right, and kind of coming right in front of this gravel bar where that water drops off. So we should expect to see a lot of fish activity along this gravel bar, along that edge, as they're feeding uh, on insects uh, being brought down by the current. As we extend down towards what we're gonna call the, the middle of this pole, we see everything slackens out. We still see that defined current line where that deeper water is, and we see some of the moss as well. That's those dark green bands. So we should be expecting to find trout right along the edges of those bands, um, right uh, on the edge of the seam of, of that current. And that kind of extends out to the tail. Now, when we go to fish this, we're gonna fish in the tail of the pool first and work our way up towards the head of the pool to reduce the chances of spooking all the fish, especially if we get lucky and, and we hook into one. So we're gonna go ahead and give that a try, working from the tail working up and eventually finishing up here in the head of this pool in this heavier current. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the flies we're gonna to use today. So here's my streamer box. Uh, we can see here lots of Crelexes, great attractor patterns, great searching patterns in multiple sizes and profiles. Uh, and then we can also see some um, Claudad and Halgramite uh, or Crittermite um, uh, patterns in order to you know, show some larger crustaceans, you know, if we want to hit those along maybe the banks. Uh, I've got a nymph box here, you know, some squirmy wormies that always work, some CK nymphs. Uh, we're going to try one of those a little later when we try some nymphing, um, as well as some attractor patterns like lightning bug nymphs, which are our great searching patterns as well, and a couple soft tackles if we see some fish, you know, that are, are chasing some emergers. Uh, I always bring a terrestrial box with me, so lots of grasshopper and cricket imitations, a couple beetle and ant and bug imitations, but we're probably not going to be using those today given that it is the middle of winter, but not a bad box to keep with you just in case. And then we go into our dry flies. If we do see some rising fish, you know, we'll probably throw on a couple of these. These are just some simple parachute, uh, some stimulators, some Elkhart caddis, uh, and some royal wolves. We also have some midges in case we see them going after some midge activity. And then uh, a little bit more of uh, some other dry flies and some other sizes as well, just in case uh, we want to go smaller or larger. 
All right, now this particular pole actually affords me the opportunity to wade a little bit, um, and I actually have some firm bottom underneath me. Now, spring creeks in general, uh, you don't necessarily need to use waders for, uh, especially things like Mossy Creek, you really don't need waders at all because you're not going in that creek. And the reason is, is that particular creek and, and many spring creeks in general, including parts of this one, are very, very muddy. They have a very soft bottom and one that, that contributes to them being so fertile. Um, but the other thing is, is that it also means that if you go to step in, you're gonna sink up to your waist in mud. Um, this particular creek is one of the reasons why I chose to come here to kind of give an instructional, is there are uh, sections that you can walk safely into the water. Now the other thing is, is that in general, I just actually had a fish just jump. Uh, maybe I will be switching to a dry fly in a minute. Um, the other thing is, is that in general, um, especially if you're fishing up on the bank, you may be fishing off the water by a foot or two or more. Uh, our spring creeks, again, because they flow through old agricultural fields or even current agricultural fields, there will be a bank, significant bank that they've cut down. A long handled net can be really, really handle for, or handy for that uh, in order to be able to safely be able to, to retrieve that fish. Um, be able to remove that hook very quickly and put it back into the water very safely. Uh, my particular net I actually have with a, a magnetic kind of clip release, so pretty easy for me to be able to, to grab that net when I need it, and then I can also snap it back into place very easily and have it hanging off by my side. I've got my streamer on, and I want to try to fish this water. So as I look out, when I've got very good fast flowing water. In fact, there's a trout right there in front of me um, at the head of this pool. As I come down and the current really consolidates into the channel that runs right along here out in front of me, there are several trout also swimming around there. In fact, there's one swimming right there in front of me. Um, I'm going to fish a little bit towards the tail of this pool with my streamer. I'm going to be casting what we call quarter downstream. So what does that mean? Upstream is up the current. Cross stream is across the current. A quarter up is exactly what it sounds like. Halfway between cross stream and upstream is quarter upstream. That's a great place to start casting your dry flies or your nymphs with your indicators and let that drift down. Quarter downstream is going to be halfway between downstream and across the stream. That is great for doing a technique of, of swinging a streamer. So I'm going to cast across, I'm going to let it catch into the current, and I'm going to strip it back with a strip strip pause technique and allow that fly to swing across that current. Now depending upon how far, how far out I cast will depend where exactly across that channel, across that current, my fly is going to swing and my streamer is going to come. Um, it's going to allow me to hit a lot of a broad area. The other nice thing, by fishing the tail of the pool, I'm not disturbing the waters ahead of me. So if I catch a fish, I can kind of work my way up, versus if I start in the head of the pool, there's a possibility I could be spooking the fish down in the tail waters. So I'm going to be attacking this stream tail towards the head. Now the, uh, I've already kind of scoped out, but as, as always, before we go to cast, uh, one of the things you want to do is look around your surroundings and notice I got a tree here. Um, and the tree's a little bit farther behind me, so that's great. I got a lot of clearance here to be able to cast. Uh, also be mindful of your winds, especially when you're casting a streamer. So we want to make sure that we don't have the winds coming directly at our face in the way that we're casting because we could end up um, snagging ourselves. And I have already caught a freshwater rock. So, all right, so we're gonna go ahead and cast. Um, now, as I need to get my line out, I am casting downstream in the shallows. I'm not casting out into the deeper water. I don't wanna disturb that water until I'm ready. So now I have enough line out. I'm gonna be casting downstream, bringing the cast back, and bringing it right down quarter stream, quarter downstream. Doing a strip, strip, pause, strip, strip, pause, strip, 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 pause. The, the idea of this streamer that I'm using is I'm mimicking a small minnow. And so I, I want to have that motion to it. 
All right, so I've cast it back out again a little bit farther this time. Strip, 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 strip. You notice I'm only doing maybe three inch to six inch strips. Not real long, that was a take, just missed a fish. So I'm not, I'm not stripping real hard and real fast. Now you can do that. There are times when that's necessary to do, especially salt water. But for our trout, typically we want to mimic a, a small minnow. All right, let me focus on what I'm doing. Anytime that you're fishing a heavier streamer, that kind of um, action can happen. So what I'm doing is I'm checking to make sure I don't have a tangle, and I do right here. So I want to make sure that before I cast out, I get what's going to be a wind knot out of my line. Streamers can put wind knots in your line very quickly. That is a weak point. It's an area where that line could break, especially if I hook into a bigger fish um, or if I get snagged, which is a lot more likely for me. All right. So I've got that out. Let's see if I can get lucky again. Doing that strip, strip, pause technique. I've got a fish coming. Checking me out. So, ah, uh, almost. So the fish came up and, and did swim away. If you noticed, now you couldn't see the fish because of the angle I had the camera, but the fish came up. I'm always watching where my line is, looking for movement in the water. And so the fish was kind of circling, but wasn't quite reacting. So I did a quick strip, 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 pause. That little quick Oh, I just noticed a trap behind me. Let me try to swim away. Panic action. See if I can trigger that predatory response and get that fish to commit. Um, in that case, it did not happen, but we're going to go ahead and try again. All right, this time, no luck. I'm gonna strip out a little bit more line. I'm gonna cast a little bit farther downstream. Now, normally, I'm not trying to cast this far. I'll just walk downstream real quietly, but then I would be off camera. And so I'm going to cast a little farther than, than normal. I'm still only casting maybe 40 feet. You know, it, it's not an extremely long, aggressive cast. It's just not something that, that you need to do. Oh, there's a fish. And he's on. Oh, and he's off. So again, as I was fishing the streamer, I saw that fish come up. He was circling the fly. You saw why I was getting a little bit more erratic in the way that I was stripping. And then I paused and I let that fly come down. And when it did that, that's when the fish hit. So we're gonna try this one more time and see if we can get lucky. The other thing we didn't talk about is how to set the hook. Now, when you're fishing a streamer, I have my rod pointed straight down my line. And as I'm stripping it in, trying one, to reduce slack on the water, reduces you know, unwanted vibration. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna spook a fish. I want them focusing on the fly, not my line. And the other thing is, is if I notice my line suddenly dart, that means I could have a fish. If it's suddenly doing something it shouldn't be doing, I might have a fish. If I feel that tug, then I know I've got a bite. At that point, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna strip strike. Very quickly, I'm gonna pull that line back. And I, if I need to, I can also pull the rod tip up, but I'm really trying to make a tight line connection in order to get that hook to set versus a, a dry fly strike where I'm just lifting the rod up. I've got, uh, <laughs> I'm talking to you guys and I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting hits. Um, all right, the fly's in a safe place. There's not a fish around it at the moment. When you uh, go to set the hook in that way, you have to lift the line off the water and you have to lift the fly up. There is a lot of energy transfer that's going to happen just into the drag of the water because my fly is lower in the water column and because it's heavier. I'm not going to actually be able to put as quickly and as efficiently the pressure onto the fish that I want to to be able to set that hook. That is why we do the strip set when we're fishing streamers. Um, that is especially true when we're fishing in the salt water. 
All right, so I'm gonna do maybe one or two more casts. Really focus on what I'm doing. See, these fish are very active. It's a little hard to fish and film at the same time. So I'm gonna focus on what I'm doing. Getting the slack out, letting that fly swing, putting a couple strips in, varying my distance if I need to, change things up. If something's not working, change up your retrieve. Go slower, go faster. You want the end result to be a fly that looks like it's alive. And if you can make it look alive and injured, that's even better. These fish want an easy meal. They don't want to go after, you know, the, the Olympic sprinter of minnows. They want something that might be crippled, easy meal, low energy output for, you know, the, the energy input they're going to receive from the perceived meal that is your fly. All right, I'm going to start working my way up a little bit. I've really worked that quarter downstream section. I'm watching the line by my feet while I'm doing this. And I'm gonna cast slightly more upstream, working a, a, a different stretch of water than what I have traditionally. And water that I haven't spooked. Being mindful now that I've got trees behind me on my cast and might have to switch to a, a roll cast here in a minute. Which should be the last thing that I show you before we stop and maybe move to a different direction. All right, so. So for the roll cast, what I want to do, and I'm going to start with my line downstream, is I want to get my line tight. With a streamer, I want to make sure that I'm getting, let me, let me put it back down, I need that line tight, and I need that streamer to start coming up in order to be able to do that effective roll cast. So as it comes, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do one, two. And that gets me cross stream. So I start with the downstream, and I'll show that again. Might as well fish it back, right? So I've started downstream. Let me give myself a little bit more line. Pulling it tight, bringing it upstream, and very quickly, I'm gonna try to cast across. Let me do that one more time in a more effective manner. I've got it tight, bring it upstream. Very quickly, a quarter across. You might have to do it more than once, there it is, to get it to go across to where I want it to go. That wasn't exactly the best example, but it did work. Um, and a lot of this is practice. The bigger and heavier the streamer you have, the harder this is going to be. So it's definitely something worth practicing and getting used to. Okay, so we are up towards the head of that pool that we were at earlier. And I actually just caught a fish. Unfortunately, did not have it on film. I'm gonna see if I can get lucky twice. I was reeling a little bit of my line. So the way that this is happening is I'm actually gonna be casting upstream. Being very mindful, I can't do an overhead cast. Casting upstream, and what I'm doing is just bringing in my slack. Just enough where the fly is getting twitched, but also to where it's not moving very, very quickly. This is keeping it towards the bottom of a little bit of a deeper pull. And if I feel a little bit of resistance that time it was bottom, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna set that hook. And I'm doing that because, you know, it's deeper than what I can actually see, although there is a trout in front of me. Could have been a hit. If I see that resistance, if I see it suddenly stop, then I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna set that hook and see if there's a fish on the end of it. I'm also twitching twitch, twitch, twitch a little bit as that fly swings down current. So I'm gonna go ahead and really work this pull, casting up stream, let my fly kind of work back, encouraging it just a little bit so it has a little bit of movement, a little bit of life to it, but mostly dead fishing. This looks like a crippled minnow coming downstream. Again, setting that hook anytime I feel the slightest bit of resistance. Might be bottom, in fact, more often than that it'll probably be bottom. Could be a fish. 
We're gonna cast a little bit quarter upstream. Remember we talked about that before. To work the entire kind of channel bottom. Letting this just work its way back. Letting it look like a dead minnow, dead fish. Now that was a hit. So you can see what that looks like, right? I'm keeping the slack, so I'm always ready to be able to set the hook. Not stripping as quickly, more or less, I'm keeping that slack in. There's gonna be a little bit of movement in that fly if needed. A little twitch, to make sure it's off that bottom. Let it come right along. That was a, that was a light hit. That's a lot of wind. <laughs> and there's a fish. You see that? As it swung around, that's when he hit. Now to land him, I want to make sure I got a barbless hook on. I'm going to try to keep that tension. I set the fish this direction. I'm going to try to keep this rod that direction as best I can. Get him over into out of the ah out of the, the, the water, the more swift water over into the slack water where I would be able to, to net him. And then get into deeper water. Encouraging it to come downstream. Watching the tip of that fly line. Holding still as it swings in front of me. Just twitch the rod ever so slightly to get it off the bottom. Let it come around. See if anything was following it. See, when that fly comes around, fish may be following it downstream. The moment you stop and it flips over and kind of flips around, that can trigger a strike. And that's exactly what happened on that last fish. It's a nice, that was a nice rainbow. Next time I need to be quiet about landing a fish and just land it. So I'm gonna, craw, I'm gonna fish a little bit straight cross stream because I know I brought one into the area. And I'll be a little bit more active. See, he may be looking for that fly trying to figure out where that minnow went. And so sometimes when you do that cross stream after bringing them down that current, that can be all you need to be able to get that strike. We're gonna do that one more time. We're gonna go cross current. I'm gonna back up slightly. I'm a little close to this edge where it drops off, closer than I wanna be. Don't want the fish to be able to see me. Don't want my fly line to spook them as it gets pulled out in the current. Constantly keeping that fly line and moving it back. Trying to keep it away from the fish. All right, so we're gonna fish upstream again. This time I'm gonna be a little bit more aggressive with my strips. Just see if that made the difference. And that was a hit. And he's, he's swimming around. Ah, that was close. See that time, They've seen this come through the pool a few times now, right? So by being a little bit more aggressive, it looks a little bit different, you know? Given that, that predatory response, letting them chase it. There was another hit. So you can see this is really starting to get them fired up. Let's see if I can get another one hooked for you guys. There's one. Okay. Oh, nice jump, nice jump. I'll give him line. He is taking me down the current. Taking me down the current. You gotta be really careful. All right, let's bring him out of that current. Keep that pressure on that fish. Mindful of my surroundings. All right, let's go for the net. Let's get down, bring him up, upstream. Straight into the net. Nice long handled net. And a nice fish to boot. There he is. Beautiful fish. Let's get him out of this net. Let's unhook him. Keep him in the water. And let him go. Okay, so here we have another pool. This is slightly uh, farther upstream and we can tell here that the current is much slower. 
we can also see that the opposite bank, the water's a lot shallower and gets much deeper as we get closer to where we're standing. Um, we're going to take a look at that bank here in just a minute, but what we can notice too is we have lots of vegetation. That's what those dark green bands are as we move all the way through. And this is kind of uniform towards the, the head of this pool as we walk down towards the tail of this pool. The water is very, very similar. This is actually great for nymph fishing. So we're going to switch over from streamers to nymphs. We'll take a look at that here in a minute. But we also want to be careful because we can see how the water is real deep against the bank. This is a, a classic spring creek area where the water has actually carved out sections under the bank. The fish could be underneath our f feet. So we want to be mindful of where we step as we go ahead and fish this entire stretch. Okay, so we've switched over to a nymph rig. So I've got one nymph set up there and a second there. And then I have my indicator just up from it. Uh, in addition, we are a little bit away from this bank. You can see that this bank has a deep cut. So this is one of those examples of where underneath my feet there is an overhang and the fish could be underneath of it. In fact, I do see some fish swimming around. So we're gonna be mindful of our shadow. We're gonna do some nymph fishing and we're gonna be casting up and along to see if we can get lucky. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and give a try at doing some nymph fishing. Now I wanna be real careful because I've got an overhanging bank and this overhanging bank is gonna be where there, there's you know, some good fishing opportunity but also where I could easily spook a fish. But I'm using a two nymph rig. I've got a smaller attractor lightning bug nymph followed by a much larger CK nymph. And then I have, um, you know, kind of my adjustable depth for my indicator up top. Now, in general, this is slower moving water. So I probably want about maybe one and a half times the depth from my indicator to my first nymph. Uh, is what I think the depth of the water is, and I can adjust that as needed pretty, pretty easily. The other thing here is, is that even though I've got a wide body of water here, the actual channel is much closer to me. The fish are going to be laid up just off this bank. Um, the other thing I want to be mindful of is I now have a hatch going on. Again, it's in January, but this is a spring creek, and we talked about how that can have insect activity year-round. So I have, um, looks like some mayflies kind of floating in the air. Uh, I want to keep an eye, now that while they're in the air, I want to be keeping my eyes on the water. If I start noticing rising fish, then maybe they're actually going after the, um, the dry flies, uh, or they might go after a dry fly, they're going after uh, things on the top of the water, and I might switch my indicator over into a dry fly and do a dry dropper. But for right now, I'm not seeing any fish up top. I'm seeing them down below. And that's telling me that let's go ahead and fish uh, using nymphs. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get ready and, and give it a cast. We're gonna be casting just upstream. I'm not worried about casting super far. Um, and I'm gonna work this bank and see if I can get uh, a fish to take. Okay, I've got a lot of wind. All right, so before I cast, I need to make sure I get my line out. I'm working the, the bank for this before I go ahead and start casting over the water. And do a nice light cast just upstream. Really keep an eye on how everything's going, making sure that, that things are getting deep enough. Um, and I'm gonna be picking up my slack real slowly, real carefully, making sure I don't really disturb the water. I'm thinking I'm gonna to need to go a little bit deeper than I am. Uh, my flies are, are a little higher in the water column than I would like, but I'm gonna go ahead and let this cast finish before I pick it up and make that adjustment. Kind of following the indicator along with my rod tip, trying to be real quiet, not spook anything. Let's go ahead and lift it up and let's, let's give that make that change. There we go. We're going to go a lot deeper than we currently are. It's the nice thing about 
an indicator versus a dry dropper. An indicator allows me to make those changes very quickly, very easily, uh, versus a dry dropper where you know I'm gonna have to change that dropper length. All right, so I've got my indicator set a little bit higher up. Casting this is going to be more difficult. This is one of the reasons why we talked earlier about doing a heavier weight rod, um, make it a little bit more manageable. But I want to be mindful of my cast. I don't need real tight loops here and I don't need to be casting you know, a, a million feet. In fact, I'm only going about 10, 15, 20 feet out in front of me. Now I'm keeping an eye on my indicator. If I see that indicator suddenly stop, if I see it suddenly go underneath the water, that means something may have picked up a fly, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'll set the hook at that point. It also could mean that I'm on bottom, so if I'm seeing it doing that a lot, then I might change the depth of my indicator. But if you're not fishing on the bottom, you're not generally where the fish are. So we do wanna be close to the bottom, and we do wanna hit the bottom periodically. We just don't wanna be hanging up every single cast. All right, so I'm letting this kind of come along. I hit the bottom there. Might need to adjust the indicator just a little bit more. Letting it come down. All right. Now I had seen some fish swimming by. This water is clear enough that even though it's like four or five feet deep, I can see bottom. Gives me a little bit of an advantage to be able to look for the fish. We're gonna go ahead and adjust. We're a little deeper than I'd like. This is part of initially setting your indicator. You should, you should be adjusting as needed until you get that depth right. Now I see a fish swimming around. I'm gonna watch him for a minute. I'm not gonna to try to cast over top of him. I want to see where he settles. You know, he's kind of cruising. You know, he's really working the area right up in front of me. And I really want to see where he's going. That way I, I have a good opportunity to catch him and not just spooking him by putting that fly immediately there just because I saw a fish swim by. So I'm going to walk up a little bit because he's working up here. And I'm going to go ahead see if I can get lucky and give her a cast. I need a little bit more line out, I think, for the next cast. It might work a little bit higher up the pool. Watching that indicator, seeing if it moves strangely. You know, these fish have camouflaged very well. They can blend in very, very well. There's a possibility that even though I'm, I'm seeing the fish, I may not see the one that actually hits. Now, I've got a lot of wind. My wind is picking up as the afternoon wears on. This is typical of our, our winters here in Virginia. So I need to be that much more careful when I go to cast that I don't hook myself or hook my surroundings. Makes it a little bit more challenging, but that's okay. Um, so another thing about using heavier weight line is I can, I can handle that wind better than I would otherwise. All right, letting this come down. And the idea of this is you're going to be working the bank. You know, now if you've got a limited pool, then sure, you're, you're going to be casting in the same general areas. But in my case, I've got a long stretch of bank that I can actually be working. And so I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I'm taking advantage of it. Now I'm going to come down this way a little bit because I've definitely noticed some fish down here. In fact, there's one just underneath of me. I may have spooked him. Hopefully I didn't. Fly come down. All 
All right. This is a much more classic stretch of Spring Creek. I've got lots of submerged underwater grass. Trout are laying up in. I've got this bank here. It's kind of overcut. I've already fished the underneath of the bank. So now I'm working my way up a little bit, seeing if I can't have one come out from the grass and go after my nymph. Letting it work down real slow. Nice, calm, gentle current. Seeing if we can't get one going for the take. Going near a fish. Giving a little bit of line. He's turned. Nah, didn't go for it. But I know where he is, so I'm cast upstream from him making sure I've got just enough slack in the line that it's gonna go straight, not drag. See if I can get it to drift right in front of them. See, these fish have tons of food. They don't need to go and chase your fly. So you've gotta be pretty good, especially when you're nymph fishing. It's a very small meal for these trout to see if you can put it, ah, that was a take. You gotta be able to put that fly exactly where the fish is. So it's helpful if you can see them. Sometimes you can't, and you just have to know the feeding lane. So that fish was right alongside of some grass, just hanging out. And he's probably not there anymore because he definitely felt the hook. Give a little bit of line. See him rising, and there he is. Fish on. That was perfect. All right. Now I've got a bank here that's pretty deep. This is where my long handled net is really gonna come into handy to be able to land this fish safely. It's a nice, nice rainbow. I wanna be careful. I wanna keep tension on him. I am using barbless hooks to land this fish. I want to make sure I've got my rod engaged, keeping tension on the fish. I know where I want to land him. I'm going to try to bring him up right towards the net and right on in. Now, unfortunately, I've got to get the fish out of the water to be able to safely get the hook out of its mouth. So I want to do this as quickly as possible. Get my fly line out of there. And I've got my fish, and I'm gonna put him right back in the water. There he goes. And that's nymph fishing. Pretty, um, pretty effective. You know, the streamers are a lot of fun. In fact, look, I'll be honest, streamer fishing is my favorite. But nymphs are, make up uh, the vast majority of a trout's diet. They're gonna consume more biomass from a nymph uh, and, and submerged underwater insects than they are from anything else. So getting good at being able to understand where the fish are gonna be laid up in the current, um, being able to see where they are, being able to predict where they should be, being able to watch those current flows, and being able to put your fly right down in that path can really lead to a lot of productive fishing and have uh, great days out on the water. Okay, so we have a little bit of an interesting uh, cover here. What we have is the remnants of an old bridge that went across. Again, in our spring creeks, they've got a long, long history. I mean, Virginia, we've had, you know, 400 years of activity in the region and the specific part where we're at within the foothills of the um, Blue Ridge and the Appalachians. You know, we're really looking at yeah, about 300 years of activity, human activity. So you're gonna find in a lot of these spring creeks uh, some type of, of artificial cover. So this old concrete bridge is actually 
perfect fish habitat. They're gonna be tight against that bridge wall. Um, there's a little bit of, of a natural deep channel here that they're gonna be laid in against. And I've switched over to a streamer. I'm, I'm back to using a Crelex. And what I'm gonna be doing is casting kind of across the stream, letting that Crelex swing just a bit and stripping it in, seeing if I can't get one last bite before the end of the day. Let's go ahead and, and give a couple of casts and, and see how that goes. Um, so again, I wanna go ahead and get my line out, but I don't wanna be doing it where I'm going to be fishing. So I'm actually gonna do it upstream. Get that line out upstream, kind of measure that distance before I'm gonna go ahead and take that first cast. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and do our first cast. We're gonna do just a simple roll cast over towards that wall and I'm just going to be going strip, strip, kind of pause, strip, strip, pause, just had a hit, see if he comes back. I can see him, he's circling, I'm just twitching the fly, twitching the fly, he's all excited and he swam off. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to put another cast back up there. Let it set for just a second, this lets the fly get down in the water column Strip, strip, pause. Strip, strip, pause. This is gonna cause our fly to come in and flutter back. Come in and flutter back. Just had a hit when I was explaining that to you guys. We're gonna do an aggressive strip. Aggressive strip. Ah, almost. This guy wants it. All right, let's try again. I'm gonna focus this time. We're gonna really strip, strip, pause. I'm doing some longer, slow strips and some short interval strips in between. We'll see. He's come up on it twice now. It may be that I'm gonna to have to let him rest for a minute before he's gonna come back. You know, he, he's had a good chance to really see the fly, so I'm gonna work a different part, see if there's another fish closer to that concrete wall before I strip back in. You might have to let that other fish calm down. That was a hit. Ah! Two hits in a row. You know, late in the day, switching over to streamers can be a lot of fun. This is really when the fish, you know, they've had all day. Uh, the water is at its warmest. It's gonna be in the day. Uh, the fish are the most active, insect activity is the most active, minnows are the most active. This can be the most productive time of the day to fish, especially in the winter months. So, all right, let's try this again. Back over towards that wall. I actually went on top of the concrete wall on the opposite bank and just lightly pulled it across the edge. That can give a really nice presentation as well. Let's see here, Let's see if I get lucky. I'm gonna let it sit for just a second before giving one or two big strips. One or two big strips. All right, so this time I'm gonna cast more downstream. Try to work a slightly different section of the water. I've had a lot of fish really active on it. Oh, there's one. Came after two swipes, missed both times. Third time's a charm. There he goes. Let's bring him in. He's running all around. He's not ready yet. He's getting there. Let's see if I can get some control on him. Really watching my fly line making sure I'm not stepping on it just in case he really runs. He's not, not the biggest today. Let's get my net out and get it ready. And I'm gonna try to land this fish right here. Bring him up, back over and netted. All right, and just like that, we've got Let's call it our last fish of the day. Nice, beautiful rainbow that we're gonna put back in the water, let them swim off. 
Okay, so that's gonna end it for this video. First and foremost, thank you so much for watching. Uh, hopefully you learned something. What we saw today was we saw a lot of good streamer fishing, um, especially as the, the day got warmer. You know, if, if you're gonna go out and you're gonna go fishing at Spring Creek um, and you can only choose either a half a day for you know either the morning or the evening, I like the afternoons and the evenings, especially in the winter time allows everything to warm up that much more that sun's going to come down help that warmer to rise a little bit granted the water temperatures as we said are going to be very stable but it can still just raise it that one or two degrees and that sometimes is all you need to really turn those fish on in addition if there is going to be uh, more insect generational activity probably in the winter time might be something that's going to be happening more in the afternoon or in the the evening again today we didn't see uh, so we saw uh, you know some midges in the air we saw some um, mayflies I actually saw a, a hatch of mayflies going on but what I didn't see was lots of rising fish right I saw maybe about two fish jump on the day uh, in addition what um, when I was fishing a, a nymph with an indicator what I saw was maybe one or two fish coming up to check out that indicator, but not really striking at it. So it wasn't, what I was not seeing were the trout showing me that they wanted to be feeding off the surface. Instead, most of our trout that we saw were really far down in that water column, down towards the bottom, um, and they were doing one of two things. They were either cruising around, which indicated to me, hey, they're chasing, maybe they're chasing minnows, they're chasing something bigger. And that's when we had that streamer on and were was very, very effective. As you saw, we definitely caught a lot of fish off of our streamers today, especially off of our tractor patterns like the Crelex. Um, and then we also saw some fish, especially when we had kind of slower moving water, classic Spring Creek kind of channel with the, uh, the underwater vegetation where they were just kind of sitting still. You know, they were just laid up it almost looked like they were, you know, sleeping or mobile. Uh, what was going on is that those fish had found themselves a nice stretch of current, were putting forth very little energy, and they were looking for small underwater insects. That's where our nymphs really come into play uh, and, and trying to expend the least amount of energy while go ahead and, and, and taking in those meals. That's when switching over to our indicator with our nymph rig was very effective. And, and in fact, the largest fish of the day was caught off of a size 16 lightning bug nymph. Uh, and it was, it was over 20 inches. Unfortunately, like I said, we didn't get that one on camera. So it just goes to show, bigger isn't always better. But what makes sense is to fish the, um, the right type of fly with the right type of presentation based upon the water, based upon the water conditions. One thing we didn't talk about is what happens when this water changes. Let's say that we've gotten uh, a lot of rain or you're out and all of a sudden rain um, is in the forecast, it's light rain, you see that water level coming up, switch over to your streamers. Bigger fish are going to be taking in their meals. This is especially true on Mossy Creek. When you get that water a little bit more stained, water levels are starting to come up, those fish can really turn on and you can really have a productive day. Um, when the water levels are up high and they've been high, we're past the rainstorm, Sometimes you can get lucky, but a lot of times it's, it's best to let the, everything start calming back down, start to clear up a little bit. Because once it becomes like chocolate milk, fish can't see your fly. Uh, but today what we had was great water levels. We had a great flow. It was relatively clear. And that allowed us to be very productive too, to be able to see the fish and be able to target them. The key to all of this though is that Coming out here and fishing, um, it, it, you know, you could saw that we had a lot of fun. We, we caught a lot of fish. It wasn't something that we really needed a guide to do. You know, if you want to venture out and hit a spring creek, you know, all year round, those fish are going to be feeding. They're going to be feeding on streamers. They're going to be feeding on nymphs. They may turn on and feed on dry flies. So you're going to be able to year round fish the same general types of flies and be very effective and have the best chance of being able to catch something. Later on in the summer, that's when those terrestrial flies that, that you saw, um, you know, our grasshopper patterns or beetle patterns can be something that, that's worthwhile to fish, especially early in the morning, late in the evening. Uh, but you know, that, that's kind of a, a selective time of the year. Other than that, 
you know, I hope you guys get inspired uh, to, to try to go out and fish on your own. Uh, we're getting closer to uh, when we can all get back together. It'll be very selective. It'll be one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we'll let you know when that, that time comes. It's not here yet, but we, we know it's going to come sometime this year, um, sometime in, in 2021. Uh, and, and we're looking forward to it. And, you know, hopefully one of the places that we can go is out to a spring creek and, and fish it and be able to put some of the things that we learned today in practice. Uh, so with that, uh, those of you in Project Healing Water Charlottesville, if you have any questions, obviously you can leave them in the comments, but you can also send me an email. And uh, for those of you who, who may not be in Project Healing Water Charlottesville and not on our email list, um, thank you for, for watching. I hope you learned something as well. Uh, we do make these videos kind of for everyone to be able to enjoy. Um, feel free to leave any questions you have down in the comments below, and you know we'll, we'll try to answer them as quickly as we can. With that, thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Man, that, that fish was great. You got me into the tree and everything. And like twitch, 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 twitch. <laughs> like twitch, 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 twitch. This is a, uh, a stickiest fishiest is the, uh, the scientific Latin name. Dude, what is this? I don't know. Sycamore. Yeah, sycamore tree. Sick of no more my fly, Mr. Tree. All right, let's do this again. Casting upstream. <laughs>